Welcome to the 2021 Global Threat Intelligence Report. My name is Tisha Lanier and I'm VP of Security Services here at NTT Data. And I am so lucky to have John with me today to talk about our Global Threat Intelligence Report. John, welcome. Thank you, Sushila. Uh, I am John Heimerl. Uh, I work for the Global Threat Intelligence Center of NTT Limited. Uh, we, my group is responsible for a lot of the publication, threat publications, uh, threat advisories, monthly report, and our biggest report of the year is, is the Global Threat Intelligence Report, which we're going to call the GTIR because the Global Threat Intelligence Report is going to be a mouthful if we keep saying that. <laughs> Thanks, John. And I, I'm on your on the mailing list, so I absolutely love those threat threat reports that you um, issue, and absolutely love the threat report. But tell our audience, you know, there are so many of these um, threat reports out there. What makes the the NTT GTIR different? I think the biggest value to me on um, the NTT uh, Global Threat Intelligence Report is the the amount of data and the, the different varieties of data and the way we use them. So we, we talk about 15,000 security engagement uh, with clients across 57 countries. We have look at 150 cyber secu security advisory assessments. We take data from our global network of security operation, operation centers. We have seven, seven R&D centers from around the world and we use our global threat intelligence platform to really wrap all this data together. What that ends up mean is we have from our um, socks, we take the log alert event and attack information. Uh, and we enrich that and contextualize that data. We take the cybersecurity data, which is benchmark data gathered from a professional services engagement, which tells us how secure companies are right now and how secure they want to be. We'll talk more about that. We take applica application security data provided by White Hat Security and we, we use collaboration expert insight from our strategic alliances with with uh, organizations like the Cyber Threat Alliance and Europol. And we add to that our kind of our global primary research, our security and our market research, um, um, workplace and securities and trends and wishes and thoughts of, of organizations in the in the in the uh, we deal with. And we combine all that together. It's a, it's a, a wider variety of data and we combine it together to get as uniform look as we can. So we look look at the same data from multiple different points of view. That's wonderful and really lots of value there because a lot of reports are just focused on kind of post event analysis. And this is really giving us information around not only client maturity and baseline information, as well as application security information. So really excited about this. Um, and tell me, so what does the report say this year? Yeah, we so there's there's more data. We, we gather and look at more data we can put in the report. And the report has more get more data that we can possibly fit in a presentation like this. But we try to take the most important elements of the report and most important elements we're seeing to say what story do they tell us? And we kind of distill those down into six key findings for purposes of our report. Um, industries in the line of fire, we saw amplified attacks on finance, manufacturing, and healthcare. Attacks against those three industries dominated everyone else. Uh, we saw malware change the way we're, we're experiencing malware. Uh, miners and Trojans replaced spyware as the most common malware. Uh, and we saw certain variants focus more on, on industries, depending on what, what the industry was and where those organizations were, what geographic region. We saw an in increase in cryptocurrency. Um, crypto, crypto miners, coin miners were 41% of all malware, which is a, it's a big increase from what we've seen in previous years. Uh, we saw COVID-19 uh, kind of emboldened threat groups. It, it gave them a, a motivation and a direction to attack, and it gave them uh, vehicles by which to identify and use as alerts to attack organizations. We saw a, a distraction, if you will, from compliance initiatives from both the client and the, and the regulator's point of view uh, to say that we saw probably less progress on regulation than we saw in previous years. But we also saw enough change in the, uh, in the world as far as what regulations were important that it really highlighted the requirements for ed, uh, elevated data privacy, privacy around the world. And we saw work from home and remote access magnify attacks. We saw a, a big change in the way organizations work as far as virtual environments, digital environments. 
And that directly impacted the types of attacks we saw and how those attackers took advantage of that. What happened, I assume, is that organizations pivoted so quickly to be able to work effectively remotely that they really may not have put as much thought process as they should have done into or could have done right into that digital transformation. And so that might be showing in, in our attack data then. Um, and tell me, so when I look through the report, I, I've got to say, you know, and I hear this from clients who, why do I care about cryptocurrency miners? So, you know, thoughts around that, we're seeing a huge increase. Do we care? Yeah, so uh, cryptocurrency miners, it's an interesting topic. So we, we saw like a 50% increase in ransomware, right? And the, the cryptocurrency miners kind of blew that out of the water with overall volume. The problem and the perception there is that a ransomware attack is, is big. A big ransomware attack always makes the news. A big cryptocurrency attack never makes the news because it doesn't necessarily mean leaked data. Um, we've actually talked to clients who said that cryptocurrency miner, eh, I don't care. It's it's not really, it's not, I'm not losing data. Uh, it's not a compromise. I'm not, I'm not worried about my data as much. Um, but our, part of the message is to us, to, for, for us, is that coin miners, um, it's not just a idle coin miner sitting in your environment. It's a, that coin miner got there somewhere. And if coin miners got in your environment, the chances are that other or other malware could get in your environment is just as just as high. I mean, think of coin miners as more of a symptom uh, than it is the problem. So if we see so much more, so much coin mining, for instance, uh, you see a lot of malware that's multifunction, right? So we don't see just coin miners. We see ma uh, malware that is a coin miner. It's ransomware. It's keyboard logger. It's got worm functionality. It's got some Trojan functionality. And you might have the same piece of malware with multi functions like that. And what we're detecting is the coin miner because that was that was that what the the bad guy, the attackers using at that point point in time. But just because they have coin mining in your environment, it doesn't mean they also don't have something else which could be more nefarious, more malevolent, and more damaging. Okay, so people need to care about coin miners. They're a little red flag going, hey, people are able to get onto your network, and we need to care about that on many, many different levels. Um, Absolutely. That really makes sense. And I know as well you were talking about um, industries, and, and do you want to just mention, you know, which industries you saw, especially under attack? Yeah, so we really saw refocusing of attacks on the three main industries of finance, manufacturing, and healthcare. So we saw a small increase in attacks overall, uh, but we saw nearly a 300% increase in attacks targeting manufacturing, more than a 200% increase in attacks targeting healthcare, and about a 50% increase in attacks targeting finance. So it's not as much we saw attacks in those three industries go up as we saw attacks being refocused from other industries to these three, to the point where these three industries, uh, finance, manufacturing, healthcare, were a target of 62% of all attacks in 2020. That's almost two thirds of all attacks were on those three industries. And we break industry analysis down for purpose of the GTR into 18 industries. So that's a pretty focused look on what attackers are looking at. And as attackers are basically saying, Finance, manufacturing, healthcare are the most valuable to me. They're most they're most productive to me. This is where I can get the biggest bang for the buck by attacking these three industries. Wow! So a real red flag for those three industries because they really are in that those crosshairs of the attackers. Very much so. Now I know that you also do a you know we do a cybersecurity advisory engagement. Now the cybersecurity advisory engagement, I love these engagements. They go in. They um, really work out what the maturity of the client is and help them establish a roadmap to move towards where they want to be, where their target security profile is. Now, um, when we look at the results there, could you tell me a little bit about how uh, security maturity in um, some of these uh, industries are reflected in um, our advisory engagements? Yes, yeah, cybersecurity advisory, the CA, it's a professional service engagement, and they do it's three things in the process, and they rate, end up rating your security, measure, they measure security on a 0 to 5.99 scale. Uh, in this, most of the assessments we're seeing are in the initial scale, initial 
bucket. That's one to 1.99. That means that their controls and processes and metrics and tools are, are pretty much ad hoc, tend to be informal, uh, and organizations are measuring there and they have goals which are higher. Uh, as a kind of a benchmark, if you're not in around the three area, high twos, low threes, you can't really talk about being a uh, good business practice and best business practice is even higher on the scale. So we think about what that means to organizations, the, the uh, cybersecurity advisory assessment process, the service actually does three things. It helps you divine where you are now. It's some, it's some assessments and interviews which say, how secure am I right now? So for healthcare, for instance, they measured out a 1.02. Manufacturing measured out a 1.21 right now, as far as, far as the, what their current practices say they are. And then part of that, what kind of controls do you have in place? What's your business objectives? What are your security objectives? What are your compliance requirements? All those types of things go into saying, where do I want to be? What should my goal be for my particular business? And for healthcare, for instance, the, the goal was set at uh, the global goal was measured out to be 3.06. So the assess, CA assessment measures where you are now, that's your 1.02, where I want to be, my 3.06, and helps you define that gap, the 2.04 gap of how do I get from where I am to where I want to be. So it's that roadmap of how I improve my overall security program. The part of the concern, I guess, or the, the interesting part, I guess, on the overall CA results was some of the things when you start doing trending across multiple years. So business and professional services, for instance, has seen a three-year increase in their cybersecurity scores. We've seen them go from 1.31 to 1.79 in the last uh, last year. Uh, healthcare, on the other hand, has gone down three, uh, sorry, health manufacturing, on the other hand, has gone down three consecutive years from 1.45 to 1.21 this year. So to see manufacturing decreasing as their world has, is changing, it should be a little disconcerting to manufacturing organizations. Uh, even at 1.21, they're not the lowest. Uh, that distinction goes to healthcare, uh, full net of 1.02. And there's lots of reasons for healthcare being the lowest, consistently the lowest rated um, benchmark. Um, security is not their business. Uh, patient care is their business. Um, the, the, Prioritizing uh, cybersecurity is a different issue for healthcare than a lot of our other organizations. So that is really fascinating. So what we're seeing is um, vertical sectors that have been forced to digitally reinvent themselves, manufacturing, healthcare. Um, you know, we've got all these wonderful capabilities like uh, remote telemedicine, which is uh, personally I absolutely love, um, but but um, perhaps, as you said, that these are verticals that, as they've transformed, haven't had the bandwidth to put in that effort into security, and it's making them a target. So again, coming back to that recommendation of security by design, um, really looking at that application security testing as well. So I wanted to... Um, end and summarize with those uh, recommendations that you have made. And I know uh, you often point out that, you know, that, that of course, each business must look at themselves closely to put it their, their own roadmap together. But I love some of these recommendations that you put forward. Could you share them with us, John? Yeah, I mean, the, the, your, your point is very valid, Sheila, that, that, that every industry is different, um, every most organizations in the same industry are different so it'd be really hard for me to sit here and say uh, if you're in finance thou shalt do this if you're in healthcare thou shalt do this uh, it's it's i think the purposes of the first set of recommendations i have is to look at what types of things we saw in the report and let's set a series of six five recommendations here on if i want to help protect myself against the things i saw in the report the malware the type of attacks what are some things general recommendations that i can focus on i think the first one i want to say is positioning cybersecurity as a key business component it should be a fundamental component of any project anything you design develop anything you do to say what is my what are my business needs, my industry, my security needs to support that business, that business need? How do not not just how do I do it, but how do I do it securely? Uh, second one is to prioritize people and process. Uh, it's it's not always just about technology, right? Uh, you want to really worry about 
people and make sure that you are en enabling employees to do their jobs in a security aware manner. You're not trying to make security experts out of everyone. No, not everyone needs to be a security geek. You're trying to merely equip them to do their jobs with training and processes, which enable them to succeed in their roles. You want to truly embrace security by design. So it's not just setting a, a fundamental initial requirement for security, but it's really making sure that as you as you progress through a design and development process, you are continually uh, going back and saying, how do I imp integrate security into this from the root of a, of a development process, of a, my initiative, my business program, whatever I'm working on to really include security in a basic fundamental design of everything I do. You want to prioritize continuous monitoring. And the bottom line on this is you're not going to be able to react to an attack you don't see. So if you're not monitoring your environment, you're going to see, you're going to miss things. You're not going to see something until it's time to, you're in pure straight react mode. So the quicker you actually observe something via continuous monitoring, the quicker you have a chance to take any kind of proactive action and head off a vulnerability or a, a attack or a breach at, at sooner. And adopt existing frameworks and standards. Um, a lot of organizations are still in the process of really defining what they want to do to uh, create and move their security programs forward. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, there are a ton of standards or frameworks already defined. Use what's already there. Um, a lot of these standards are built for, for a purpose. They've been built and they're, they're tried and true. So use what's there to help guide your program instead of trying to build something from scratch. Wonderful. And um, one of the things I noticed, and I know technical recommendations are always difficult because people have different infrastructures in place, but I really like some of the technical recommendations that were made in, in the report. And I want to kind of highlight a few. Uh, one that, in fact, it was interesting in the wake of the colonial pipeline, the government, uh, the U.S. government came out and said, the Biden administration said, hey, you need to implement multi-factor authentication. I noticed it's an in our report, really of identity as the new perimeter. If you're not strengthening identity, then uh, you have some real issues. And I love the fact that you've called out, look, you need to use multi-factor authentication. You need to look at privileged account uh, management because what happens is people get on your network, they move laterally, they're looking to increase their privileges. So you really need systems in there to ensure that you're subjecting that to some kind of workflow. Um, and then network segmentation as well. I mean, I, I still remember people when they were interviewing people post not pet your attack and said, you know, why were you different from organizations that had suffered incredibly from that attack? And the organizations that were least impacted said we did two things. We patched and we segmented. So love to see both of that in these recommendations. Any other ones, these in here, John, that you want to highlight that especially as far as technical recommendations go? Yeah, I think there's been, the first two are probably one, two of my um, hot buttons, you will. Updating software, we still see a lot of attacks running against old, old software. Um, Patch management is not always a simple process, but if you patch vulnerabilities, you can eliminate a lot of the old vulnerabilities that attackers are using, have automated, and that they are the attacks that attack that are really easy for attackers to do. And the same thing for vulnerability scanning. Vulnerability scanning is going to find those holes in your environment, a lot of which are going to be fixed via patching or other mitigating controls, but a lot of them are going to be fixed by patching. They're going to find, identify things where the vulnerability is available to be ex exploited from the outside world. And if the, you can fix those, you can patch your environment and fix those things before an attacker can, it has a chance to really reduce your threat profile. Like part of the message in looking at 15 or more vulnerable um, technical recommendations is that everybody could probably take advantage of and be better off if they implemented all 15 recommendations. And I think it's it's incumbent on organizations to say which one or two or three of these types of organizations can I actually succeed in implementing and will make progress in in positive progress 
and having a positive impact on my environment. So I caution people to pick some of these. Anything you do here is going to improve your organization, improve your security profile. So I caution organizations to evaluate which one, two, or three are going to have the biggest effect. That we can actually, you can actually take them and the organization can actually take them and actually implement things and make progress on them. And if you can't do something against execution prevention or exploit protection, I mean, pick pick recommendations that you can actually uh, advance on and you can actually um, improve your current controls in. And why not today have a look at those 15 and rate yourself if you haven't had a cybersecurity assessment uh, done against you and look at your 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 um, maturity against this at 15 different areas and really kind of identify how you can improve um, in these technical recommendations and where you want to be. Uh, but wonderful, really, really, I have enjoyed this report so much, John, and it's been so wonderful having you. All right, thank you.